So what tool are you using for this? Um, I use different tools over time on uh, Windows and on Linux. On Linux now I use an open source undervolting tool. Um, you can just install it with pip install undervolt and then you're ready to go. And then you provide it with some offsets? Yeah, yeah, pretty much like this. So let me just type this here in. Ah, uh, there, yeah, yeah. Okay. It looks pretty much like this. Sudo undervolt minus, minus core minus 200 minus minus cache minus 200. Then you run this and... Oh, wait, uh, I know it. I think your machine just crashed. Everywhere, most of the time we run aware, but horses know we're leaking all the time. When looking in the fridge, when Gavin does the bidding bridge, the sergeant all for fun and for the prize. Cause sergeant all is our way us all the time. I'm telling you, you just copied my code. Why do you think that? He had zero points on the test system, so he asked me, and I gave him my code so he could maybe check what he got wrong. Yeah, but maybe he just fixed his bugs. Come on. It's like it took five minutes and now he has all the points. Maybe it was small bugs? I don't know. Daniel? Yeah? You still have root access to Claudio's server? I think so, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you check this for me? Sure, yeah. I think they, I think they copied my submission. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure I can help there because uh, the files are encrypted and Claudio now has everything in SGX, so... I doubt that I could get the key from that. Hmm. Hey guys, I found a paper on voltage glitching. Voltage glitching? They reduce the supply voltage of the circuit and after some time something goes wrong. So imagine you have a combinatorial circuit and there usually you have a 1 and a 0 representing the high and low states and the high state is usually a high voltage and the low state is a low voltage. And if you now reduce the voltage, the operating voltage, it takes for the circuit longer to charge its capacitance and therefore it takes a longer duration to get to this high voltage states. And if you think about a fixed frequency, a fixed frequency circuit, it can happen that you miss the deadline there. Why exactly do low voltages cause faults in some CPU instructions? A CPU is built of logical gates, which consist of multiple MOSFET transistors each. A MOSFET transistor works like an electronic switch. If a voltage is applied to the gate, electrons can flow from the source to the drain. This is how a NMOS transistor looks like in silicon. The silicon between the source and the drain is not conducting. If now a positive voltage is applied to the gate, it attracts electrons that create a tunnel, making the silicon conducting. The higher the voltage, the faster this tunnel is created and the transistor turns on. If the voltage is lower, the transistor takes longer to turn on. The exact relationship between voltage and switching time varies with every one of the billions of transistors of a CPU due to process variation. Process variation describes the small natural occurring differences between every transistor mate in silicon. Here we can see the propagation time of a CMOS inverter circuit in relationship to its supply voltage normalized to the propagation time at 2.5 volts. One can clearly see that the propagation time increases with lower voltages. Let's look at the logic gates again and the functionality they implement. For example, the logic circuit of an integer multiplication. Integer multiplications are quite complicated and require a great number of logic gates to complete. As an example, we see here the multiplication circuit for two two-bit numbers, which is still quite small. If the input values for the IMAL circuit changes, the new signal propagates through the circuit with the transistors opening and closing based on outcomes of previous transistors. Because transistors do not switch instantly, every logic gate has a certain propagation time. And we already know that the switching speed of transistors depends on the voltage. Therefore, if the supply voltage is lower, the signal propagates slower through the circuit. For a CPU to function correctly, all logic gates must be in the correct, finished state when the next clock cycle arrives. 
The slowest propagation time of the circuit must not be larger than the time between two clock signals. If the supply voltage is too low, the next clock cycle can be too early, manifesting a not yet ready result, for example, of a multiplication. This is what we call a fault. For a voltage glitching attack, the supply voltage is reduced dramatically for a very short time. Usually it is pulled down to zero volts by connecting the supply voltage line to the ground line. The timing must be very precise, less than one clock cycle long and at a specific offset within a clock cycle. If everything is right, the CPU does not completely crash, but the current executed operation performed during this clock cycle very probably produces wrong results. With a low voltage attack, where the voltage is reduced for longer periods, only instructions can be faulted that are complicated enough. The signal propagation time through, for example, the OR instruction is so short that at no voltage level the next clock cycle can be too early. The CPU simply stops functioning way before the voltage can be reduced to low enough values. With a voltage glitting attack, however, every instruction can be faulted. It only must be hit exactly. A popular target are branch instructions to reach code parts where a correct functioning CPU would not jump to. So you would use that in an attack? What would be the typical targets for that? Maybe a branch instruction? Think of that you basically can skip it in some sense if you miss the target. Ah, and if you skip it, that means that you bypass maybe some security check? Oh. Well, most voltage glitching attacks I've seen target cryptographic algorithms. Yeah, and uh, that's the same as in side channels because in side channels also um, cryptography was nice because it has a very clear thread model, a valuable secret, the key, and it's very easy to argue uh, the relevance of a side channel there or a fault attack when you can break crypto. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. leaking and attacking something else, like system level applications or databases leaking some stored data, that can be more tricky, right? Or even user input. Oh yeah. So when you reduce the voltage, mm -hmm. It crashes. No, no. It's running all fine now. Oh. Yeah, see? Nothing crashed here. So what if there's a range of an undervolume range, basically, where the system still runs stable, meaning it doesn't crash, but some computations produce incorrect results? And how do you exploit that? I mean, I'm an attacker. I can run instructions where I know that they are instead. Yeah, but you need root. Pseudo undervolt, you need root. All right. Yeah. Why don't you attack STX? The STX threat model includes root attackers, and they claim to still protect against that. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's try something basic first. If we run a simple loop and have a condition in there, and we try to jump out of this loop via undervolting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Check this out, Daniel. Check this code out. It just performs multiplications over and over again. Uh huh. And the condition there? This condition can never be satisfied. So this code here should be unreachable. Uh huh. Is this a toy example from the Plunderbolt paper? Very similar, yes. And if you run this, this will never end, right? Yes, except if we undervolt it. So 150, 155. 160, 165, 170, 175, 180, it faulted. See, we reached the wow. unreachable code with this POC. Wow. And that's the bit error you see here. Yeah. Wow. But SGX is integrity protected. So this wouldn't work on SGX, right? Wait, let me start this. Okay, here it starts. 170, 175. 180 again. It worked again. Wow. So you faulted SGX? Yes. And it worked just the same as without SGX? Huh. 
I think that's surprising. Yeah, but I thought so, because SGX only assumes that the CPU is secure and it provides protections against the parts outside of the CPU and therefore gives memory protection and integrity. Yeah. But for the CPU ports which work inside of a CPU, they are not protected. But I mean, this looks cool, but this is nothing exploitable. A real attack would have to target something real like RSA or in case of the test system, maybe something like uh, decrypt the submission, maybe breaking AES or something. AES and I. I mean, after you broke my AES implementation on the test system, I obviously switched to AES and I. Makes sense. Yeah, I'll think about that. Irina? Yeah? Do you have a minute? Oh, sure. Um, can you check this out? Yeah. So? I want the opinion on an attack. Yeah? So it's on Ares A. And here we see the signature formula for performing an Ares A signature with the private message M the private exponent d and the public modulus n. So basically a um, modular exponentiation. Yeah, but the exponent d is really, really big. Yes. Yeah. Fortunately, there's the Chinese remainder theorem. Right, so they split the exponentiation into two smaller ones and with some mathematical tricks get to the same result modular n. The thing is, there are multiplications in here and we know we can fault them. So, if you're able to fault a multiplication, you can get a corrupt signature. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that the fault happens somewhere in here, in the first part of the one of the smaller exponentiations. And then? And then you have two signatures, one correct and one faulty. But we don't even care about the actual value there. So, actually, you can subtract one from the other, and then you and have... Then you have something times q. And q is private. Yes. But n is p times q and n is public. So I now can use the GCD to compute q. Oh, so you get q and then you can compute p as well. Exactly. That should work. Yeah, I'll try that. It works. Yeah. So, uh, you got the key? Yes. So this attack follows the idea of a bell core or lens dry attack. Uh, one faulty signature is enough and you get the key. Yeah, fault attacks are quite powerful. Mm -hmm. So look at this. I can see here both Q and P and they should both be private. Oh, so you can now decrypt the submissions. Um, wait, no, this is the signing key, Claudio's signing key. Oh, why did you get this one? I don't know. Um, maybe you should target the AES key instead. Yeah, if you could attack AES, that would be really powerful. Yes. Let's, let's check this out. And if we, if we break AES, that would have a lot of impact. We might really become famous this time. Mm -hmm. I think we should check out the slides again. Yes. The, the rounds of AES, you mean? Yeah. What happens if I fall somewhere in here? In the last round, after the S-Box, I'm not sure you gain anything from that because that's basically then the ciphertext. And if you flip a bit in there, you also don't learn anything. Okay, in the ninth round then. Then the arrow would propagate through the last round. The key would be used to do this S-Box lookup here. And uh, that means so you could take the difference of the ciphertexts and compute backwards through the last round and get a bunch of key candidates. Hmm. And this should even work for two or three rounds backwards. Yeah. And this is what we call a differential fault attack. And it's again the one from the Plunderbolt paper, right? Yeah. Just like the RSA attack. Exactly. Yeah, I think I will try this out. It worked. It worked again. Oh, so you got the ES key now? Yeah. Should I show you? Yeah. This is it. Wow. So, is it plagiarized or not? Uh, I could check. Can you show me the submission of group 28? Sure. Yeah, wait a second. So, didn't we say we don't want them to just decrypt and access data on the test system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't have any idea how to fit it in uh, the story of this episode otherwise. It's just for the show. Uh, in real life, they shouldn't do that. Yeah. Another way how Plundervolt can be used for an attack on SGX is to target pointer arithmetics. 
For instance, if you have an array with a specific data type and you want to access a specific index in this array, then internally this array access will use a multiplication with the element size so that it accesses the right memory location. When faulting this multiplication, the resulting address will point outside of the enclave memory and the attacker can map pages there to then obtain the data that the enclave would write there. Okay, doesn't look like my solution. What are you guys up to again? Oh, we sus uh, suspected someone submitted code copied from me, but it turns out they didn't. Obviously, I run plagiarism checks against the submissions from the past five years. Oh. But anyway, how did you check that? Yeah, Claudio, I got your private RSA key and also your AES decryption key. How did you do that? We used Undervault team to Undervault the SGX enclave. You Undervolted it? Yeah, we broke AES. I mean, like in the Plundervolt paper. Plundervolt paper? Yeah, so they undervolted the CPU and that allowed them to recover some cryptographic keys. Like, there are also other papers like Volt Pawn, Volt Jockey, Clock Screw. The Clock Screw paper is from 2017 and it is one of the earliest works in this space. In Clock Screw, the attacker runs in the kernel and manipulates the clock frequency, but not the voltage. The attack target is the ARM Trust Zone Trusted Execution Environment. With Clockscrew, an attacker can leak cryptographic keys from Trust Zone and escalate to Trust Zone privileges. In 2019, the Vault Jockey paper showed that the effects of Clockscrew can also be achieved by manipulating the voltage instead of the clock frequency. They combined this with a differential fault attack and leaked AES and RSA keys from Trust Zone and with this again escalated to Trust Zone privileges. In parallel to Plunder Vault, other works have also explored the same underlying issue. One of them is Vault Pawn. Vault Pawn provides a thorough analysis and shows how induced bit flips can also lead to control flow deviations. Another work from the Vault Jockey author shows that their basic attack methodology also works on Intel processors. But, but why wasn't it patched then? How would you patch it? You could restrict access to that software interface for undervolting. It already requires root privileges. You could completely remove the interface. I think that's what they did with a microcode patch, but I would have to check why this is not installed on my system. But I was also hoping that SJX would help me with this, but yeah, I'm shutting the system down in a few weeks anyway, so who cares? Mm -hmm.